So thank you all for joining at a 9.30 in Miami. Um, I know that's not an obvious hour to be here, so I appreciate you all coming in. Hopefully we'll have some fun, and uh, hopefully the coffee's strong enough. Um, I'm gonna jump, jump in. I got a really, really cool uh, panel here that I have the, the honor of moderating. Um, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves in a second, um, but we're here to have fun. So for those who don't know me, I'm LD. I'm one of the founders at Cherry. Um, we're a real estate data management company, so we help large firms, you know, big asset managers, banks, insurance companies connect disparate data to help make better investment and underwriting decisions and also management decisions as well. Um, if you want us, find us at some booth otherwise. Um, but I'm gonna start with our really cool panel. Uh, I'm gonna start with you, Sandra. Um, and if you could all um, not just, you know, introduce yourself, but just tell us a little about what the last 18 months have been like in your organization. That'd be awesome. Absolutely. So hi, everyone. I'm Sandra Wenger. I am with CBRE Investment Management. We recently changed our name from uh, Global Investors to Investment Management. We are about a 130 billion private equity firm, and we look at both real estate and infrastructure. I uh, head up the commercial real estate for the Americas and focus on office, life science, and retail. So for me, the last 18 months has been really interesting because one, I just started the job uh, in June, uh, moved from the West Coast to the East Coast. Um, but more importantly, I have the problem children of the asset classes, so office and retail. So it's been really fascinating in trying to figure out, you know, there is office that is going to survive this, and if you can really pick the right strategies and in kind of the right cluster locations, office is gonna be just fine. But it's definitely a story of the have and have nots, and it's been a really interesting case study. Oh, that's awesome, thank you. Joanna? Good morning, Joanna Zabriskie. I'm president and CEO of BH Companies. We are an owner operator of multifamily communities in 26 states across the country. Uh, we've got just over 105,000 units, 350 properties. We're headquartered in Des Moines and Dallas. Um, the last 18 months has been really interesting. Uh, we, being in multifamily, we're in a kind of a, a more favored um, asset class, but you know we've been dealing with eviction moratoriums and rental assistance funds and things that we have never ever contemplated as part of our core operational strategy. So uh, lots of lessons learned, but we grew 11% uh, last year in COVID and 6% this year. So grappling with a growth strategy while everybody's working from home and dealing with COVID has been interesting, but a lot of fun. Oh, that's awesome. Jesse? Uh, yeah, so Jesse Carrillo, Chief Information Officer with Heinz. Heinz is a global commercial real estate firm in 27 countries, over 250 cities. Uh, you know, predominantly office, but we really, really leaned into multifamily living uh, with some student housing and some senior living as well. Uh, and definitely industry as well, especially in our uh, countries outside of the U.S. Uh, I'd say for me, the, the last 18 months has been about the COVID hair. Uh, so it just reminds me, I probably need a new headshot because I don't know who that guy is on that, on that screen. But uh, uh, no, it's, it's kind of echoing what's been set up here. Uh, you know, Heinz, we're well positioned in those 27 countries, a lot of diversification. And so we've, we've actually had a pretty decent couple of years from a business perspective. Uh, but that definitely has been challenging for our team members and, and all our employees. So, so we're about close to 5,000 employees, uh, and so we've really focused on how do we get everybody uh, out of the pandemic mindset and hopefully back into the, the jazziness of an office, uh, and I think we're gonna talk about that sometime today, but just, again, jazz to be here with everyone. It's just so nice to be out and about again. I can't grow long hair anymore, and I shaved my beard today because I can't compete with Jesse's goatee, so <laughs> we're working on looking like adults here. Um, so if we had this you know, panel five, ten years ago, we wouldn't be talking about likely how technology integrates, or if we did, we'd probably be talking about very you know, moderate, moderate technology, whereas where we are today, technology is a key part of your organizations, right? It's the core of everything you do, um, and it's becoming much bigger, right? So maybe start, Jesse, maybe with you. Um, what's different? Why, why are we talking about this you know, today where we haven't had these conversations five, ten years ago? Are the applications exploding? Is there a lot more data? Is it more complex? And maybe we'll start there and we kind of dive in. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I didn't mention that uh, I've been at Heinz a very long time. So I've been there 27 years, uh, last 14 as CIO. And, and so again, you know, as we all, a lot of us have been in this, in this industry, technology was, was very much a laggard when it came to this industry. And so everybody, you know, um, some of the leadership when I started at Heinz in 94 talked about big chief tablets and pencils. 
uh, you know, and that's what they wanted to do their, their accounting and, and their record keeping. And so I think it took a long time, and I, I know there's some veterans in here in IT as well that have been on the journey with me of trying to get this industry to really move the needle. Uh, and, and we struggled for a lot of years, a lot of years. And so it's been pretty exciting for me as an IT profession the last five or six years, just because of folks like you in, in the audience, that they really started to push the industry. We had a bunch of new folks come in and say, you know, there's an industry ripe for disruption, and, and what can we do to do that? And so, so we've seen a, a tremendous amount of, of disruption, but I think just the, and I, and I hate to use the word, but maybe acceptance of leadership in real estate that, that technology does drive our industry. Uh, and I, I tell you, I almost fell off my, my seat one time when one of our leaders said that, you know, Heinz is becoming a technology company that invests in real estate. I mean, I, I waited like over 20 years for someone to say that, but, but it is reality. And I think a lot of that is a kudos to a lot of you folks in this room and including you with Ducheria of pushing us uh, as IT leaders, but just pushing our, our industry forward. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Joanna, maybe what, what does your, you know, journey look like right now? And I'd love to dive in after I'd like some details to get us have some fun. Well, I second what Jesse said. It's been it's been a journey, and we were laggards, um, multifamily especially in, in real estate asset classes, to the tech journey. And I remember back in 2014 going out really looking for a, a data technology platform that would, you know, I'm an asset manager by heart, give me visibility across our then 45,000 units. And uh, it was hard to come by. So we actually invested in a company, helped them grow, and got that product, uh, which was then bought by RealPage, and they broke it, but uh, <laughs> they wanted the data. And that started us out on the journey where we actually had to invest in um, a prop tech company in order to get the vision of what we wanted. And as more and more capital found prop tech, rent tech, fintech, uh, we realized that we are really an owner operator of real estate and, and not equipped to handle the evaluation of some of these companies that and the capital that was coming into the industry. So we actually invested in a fund um, that goes out uh, that is multifamily owners and operators. Um, we are an LP in that fund, and they are our R&D arm. And we did that about three years ago now, when we realized we didn't have the bandwidth to successfully evaluate whether or not the platforms that were coming into the industry would remain in the industry, were su sufficiently capitalized, that had the right senior team, that had the right engineering team. And so that's been a great assistance because we, amongst our peers, um, are evaluating new smart tech platforms, new fintech prop, uh, platforms, and investing together in these companies and growing with them. So I, I think uh, the capital forced us, uh, that was coming into the industry, forced us to step back and, and essentially hire some professionals to help us with our uh, tech needs, because we couldn't do that in-house. But as a result, we're, we're much better positioned than we were you know, five, six, or even three years ago. I find it pretty incredible. For those who don't know, the R&D spend in real estate per capita is lower than pretty much every other industry that you can think of. So throw a dart on any major industry and real estate's abysmal. And basically what that means is we've outsourced our R&D strategy to startups or other funds that can do that, which is cool for us the startups, but it's really not cool for the industry. It means that we've been laggards to, to Jesse's point earlier. Um, Sandra, I know that you spent a lot of time um, thinking about you know, how do we make our buildings more interesting at the end of the day? And I'm sure you get pitched, I don't know how many technology ideas on an, on an average week. Some I'm sure are really cool. Um, how do you think about sifting through that noise and, and deciding, you know, what is interesting to even explore and what do we just pass on? Yeah, so, you know, what we're really looking at is, you know, our return on investment for technology. And it's not necessarily the economic return, but what is really going to keep tenants get tenants excited about the building and stay in our buildings and make them more competitive. So we're very, um, very focused on that kind of technology. Um, we've looked at, you know, we get pitched on everything. We've got multiple verticals. You know, I focus on office, but we also have apartments. We have uh, logistics. And we're constantly looking at what kind of balance sheet investments that we think are most interesting and what's going to enhance you know, valuation in our current existing portfolios and what we can really develop a service around. So uh, we're incredibly active in that and um, are constantly looking at potential new deals that are gonna make our buildings much more effective. Uh, thanks, so Adriana, to, to Sandra's point, um, it's not just return on capital immediately, right? So some of that 
and again, I, I don't want to sound cynical, but we don't really care about saving money often unless it's like really a lot of money, right? So assuming it's a small amount of money, we care, but we don't care as much. And we always like to say that we care about making more money and creating more alpha or things like that. But those, to Sandra's point, are things that are a lot harder to measure in the short term. So when you think about some of those things that you're rolling out across your organization, how do you think about the short term immediate value, maybe cost saving or maybe some immediate revenue unlocked versus the longer vision that hopefully will happen within the organization, but it also has some, some doubt? That's a great question. Um, I will go on record with saying we care about saving money. <laughs> we, we care about the expense savings. We all do. <laughs> so that is part of the equation. But operational efficiency and integration are two things that come to mind right away. We don't want to roll something out that doesn't play well in the sandbox with all the other things that we have in the organization. And so integration with the capital I is really key. And then saving our on-site team members uh, time. We want them to be focused on sales and service and take, take away some of the administrative functions and, and move them to a, a technology platform or to um, a centralized service group. And I think we're all talking about centralization these days. But the hard part about this is how do you choose? You, you, Sandra, you mentioned it. Uh, how many emails a week do you guys get from new, te from new or existing um, tech platforms. How do you evaluate all that? The onslaught of these emails and phone calls is pretty amazing. And, and maybe to continue on that with, with you, Joanna, so how do you actually sift that? Is there a team in-house whose job is to evaluate it? Is there a pilot program that's pretty structured that, you know, if you meet certain criteria, you go through? Or is it, hey, let me wait to see if some of my other operators in our network say, hey, this is really cool. Let them try first, and then we'll kind of try it on our own? Well, I'll tell you, I am not the person to email with a new idea. <laughs> there are people much more qualified in my organization to handle that. And uh, so it's, it's just a lot of noise right now with all the new startups or existing platforms, um, and they're coming at you all the time. So I, I think you know, the way we evaluate it is I want to talk to my peer group. I want to understand what's working, what's not working. I'd rather that you know, they break something and make it better first. We've done that with a number of the platforms that we're using. Uh, so there's a constant con conversation amongst um, the peers that I trust that are technology forward, uh, always listening to hear what they're doing, um, watching and, and listening, coming to conferences like this and talking to the, the vendor booths and understanding um, what's out there. Uh, but being very, very intentional about the new products that we choose, testing them on a small group of assets first and making sure they play well together with the existing tech stack that we have in, in place. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and Jesse, you have not just the, the privilege, quote unquote, um, of having to sift through this noise, you also have to implement these problems. And you also have the privilege, quote unquote, of being in pretty much every major geography. So you have this added challenge of, does this work? Does this work everywhere? Do I want it everywhere? If it just works local, I want to give them the flexibility to be local, and then the shift of the, the burden of making this all work together kind of shifts the organization. So what does that look like on your end, and maybe how big is that technology team that has to deal with all these problems? Yeah, so again, I think for us, very similar. I mean, we're, we're very inundated with, with new technology. You know, view this, demo this. Of course, it's not just email, LinkedIn, social media, everything else. And so. So I think for us, what we, we decided was we needed, we needed more than just an IT organization to do that. So we've actually stood up an innovation office. We've stood up a, a business technology group that's focused on, on processes at the building level because we do property management and, and integrated facilities management as well. Uh, so we set up these groups that really are the, the conduits for a lot, of this, a lot of this startups and a lot of these new organizations or vendors that are coming in. And, and so that the goal is for them, for us, to collaborate internally more. And so having these groups, so if you're in Europe and, and you're, you're accustomed to having a relationship with someone in Europe, we have a team in Europe that you can go to and, and see if something will work for Europe or work for a certain country there. Uh, and then same thing with, with Asia Pac or the United States. And so, so we've decided that, that we can't do it from a central perspective because, again, going back to what Joanna and, and Sandra said, it's a local business. And so we have to have folks on, on the ground that, that we're making their lives better. And so we, we created these groups. And then our job, uh, and my job and my team's job, is to stay coordinated with all these other internal groups. Uh, you know, we don't call them shadow IT. You know, we call them business partners. And so the idea is that then we can increase the funnel. So, so you guys have a bigger shot to actually get to someone at Heinz versus coming straight to me or, or you know, as Joanna said, don't, don't email her all the time because we get so much of it. But having this, this team of folks that are evaluating on all, all time is just important. But I think, you know, Joanna said something key is, 
is what is, what is your, your goal, your mission? For us, it's about the data. And I know you, you the Cherry and LD, you guys do an amazing thing with, with your product. But, but when we look at te technologies, it's, it's integration, but it's, it's what can we gather from it from a data perspective? And, and that's, I think, what drives everything, every decision we look at. And so if, if you're developing technology or software, it's really about what you're collecting for us and how can we leverage that in our internal database data warehouse. So, so it's all about the data when we evaluate. Uh, and then one, I'll, I'll leave one more thing is being global, when we started this journey four or five years ago, we were looking at startups that we wanted them to try to scale globally. I mean, we needed them in all, all, every country. But the reality is, and you guys know it, it's hard. It's hard to scale. Uh, it's, it's hard to scale in the U.S., much less when you try to get outside the U.S. And so I think what we've done is, is made the determination that since our focus is data, we're okay having more niche solutions in certain countries, certain pockets, certain asset types, because not all software work for all asset types. And so I think we've made that decision that that's okay, that, that these startups, you know, if they do a great job at one thing, great, keep doing that. We're not going to force you to go try to scale to 27 countries in the next two or three years because it's just hard. Uh, and so, so I think that's helped us a lot, find some really good technologies that we really can implement in some of our, our, our portfolios. So, so I would say that's probably the biggest lesson learned that I've had in the last two or three years. Because and everybody has an API. As long as the, as the API connects to the data cube, you, you're able to go out and do that. And that's, that's a new event in you know, the last couple of years, that we can move data around um, and, then, and then analyze it ourselves instead of having it out there on the cloud. Absolutely. And just one thing that I would add to kind of what Jesse touched on, but, you know, another approach is we're very intentional on what it is that we're looking for. So part of what I do is come up with the office strategies on how we're going to move forward with office. And part of that is what data is going to help me achieve my strategy. So if I'm looking into life science, you know, what new data out there, if, if life science is going to be our new strategy, what, what data can I use to, to better that strategy? Or I believe, you know, the future of office is in technology. So, you know, what, what services out there can really understand the access that a property has to technology? So we, we also, you know, not only do we get incomings, but we are also um, very intentional in the sources that we look for. I just want to repeat some of the things they just said in kind of a succinct form, because I think they're really important. One is um, start with the solution at the end, not with the data, not with the application, not with the cool startup idea. Go to the end, which is how is this going to be used across the organization? How is this going to be impactful? And if it's not, I don't care how cool that technology is or application, it's not going to make a difference. Second is, if it's very impactful but at only certain places of the organization, don't let that be an inhibitor, whether that's geography or asset class or something. If you can make that work within your organization, and it shifts the burden, right? Because that burden is not going to fall on that you know, specific multifamily you know, leasing automation software, which might be really cool and you really should have it in your organization. But now the burden of connecting that to your, let's say, accounting system like a Yardi or J.D. Edwards becomes your problem and not that firm's problem. Um, the third thing we heard here is that um, if we're thinking about what matters in our organization, data is very much going to be a driver of what creates alpha, right? So we use the future of office, for example, or data, or, or um, sorry, life science. What is moving the needle and helping us decide what these things are? And you should think about what program do I have internally to allow me to very quickly analyze these types of things without having to spend a ridiculous amount of resources just to find out this data set's really not that exciting to me for our decision-making process. Um, I want to continue with you, Sandra. So you mentioned kind of the future of office was you know, the last thing you said there in that, that context. And, and I want to dive into that, but I also want to put some framework around that because what is the office is kind of this weird question right now. So I, we're about 20, 30% occupancy in most major cities. Miami's a little different always a little different, but specifically also when it comes to occupancy. Um, and yet we're all still working, right? It's not that we stopped working. We just stopped going to the office every day for at least a, a short period of time, a year and a half right now. So maybe let's start with you, Sandra. What is the office, right? And does your responsibility now as an asset manager of office also extend to the home or other areas where uh, spheres of influence of where these employees might be? Yeah, so, you know, I, it, it's not a binary question. It's, it's not home or office. It's, it's really both. So if you're going to be a leader, if you're going to be a company, you really have to have technology solutions that are good for both, both atmospheres. So talent, you know, what is most scarce right now to companies is talent. 
And so you want to be as competitive as possible in chasing that talent. And in order to do that, talent really wants a mix. They don't want to be 100% one in one direction or the other. So, you know, we're having a watershed moment in office. Which ones are going to survive? Um, we're seeing a divergence. Uh, I talked a little bit about there's certainly the have and the have nots in office. Um, you know, buildings are going to be really important to have that have building that's going to be able to attract talent. So, you know, we believe that what is the have building? It's, it's the one that uh, is in a vibrant community, it's hospitality driven, it's technology enabled, and it's environmentally and socially conscious. So, um, you know, at the end, uh, we believe that um, office is also going to be used differently. So we recently did um, a user study, and it was interesting because um, we did it in the middle of 2021, and all the stuff that was important, you know, prior to COVID had fallen to the bottom of the list. And there were new things that were coming out, you know, as emerging as being uh, what, what people want. And it was really flexibility in space, so being able to expand and contract your office space readily, being technology enabled, and then wellness. Um, so those have all made it to the top of the list. In the meanwhile, the stuff that used to be important, um, you know, like fitness centers, on-site food amenities, access to public transportation, that's all moved to the bottom of the list. And it's not to say that those are no longer interesting, but those are now table stakes for users. That, that's, that's their baseline requirement. So it was interesting to see kind of how everybody's um, interest has changed post-COVID. So you still have to invest in the gym and the food and everything, but now you just have to invest in all these other you things as well. You have to invest more. <laughs> yeah, so our CapEx just went up. can't get rid of that, yes. Um, Joanna, so you, when I look at the multifamily portfolio, how is that affected, right? So if people are gonna spend more time at home working, maybe not driving to the office as much, how does that change your amenity mix when you think about building new buildings or retrofitting existing ones? Right, people are spending a lot more time on their communities than they were previously, and that's created all kinds of opportunities as well as some challenges. Uh, we, pre-COVID, um, were investing in retrofitting our clubhouses with a shared work environments, and they took off in COVID, so we had to um, install some dividers and some of the sanitary solutions across the clubhouses so we could keep people working. Uh, managed Wi-Fi has been huge. The connectivity piece um, is critical to, to home environments, our, our, our multifamily environments now. Also pre-COVID, we invested quite a bit of money in uh, the amenity redesign where we're having indoor outdoor fitness centers, the ability to move um, the Peloton bikes outside and, and have a spin cycle class outside. Uh, we did a lot of um, uh, outdoor fitness tracks, um, putting equipment around walking environments where we had them in suburban locations. So. That all served us well, and we've doubled down on that now um, because of all the all the things that Sandra mentions that you know the things that were important pre-COVID have um, have carried through, but other things have not. Right? Um, people don't want to be doing as many um, uh, resident events and being together, but they do want to um, work from home and have that that fitness ability. So, hey, so, so Jesse, when I think about what that means, you know, continuing on this. Um, you know, the workplace is more than just a physical space and, and you now interact with the inhabitants of that space in, in multiple ways. Has that raised the need for tenant experience apps or are those things still feeling like they're discovering their way? Well, when it comes to tenant experience, I think it's interesting because I've been on a journey for a few years and, and it's definitely gone up and down. I think it was starting to see a really rise right before the pandemic. I mean, we were deploying tenant experience apps. Everybody needed them in, uh, in their spaces and all of a sudden the COVID hit pandemic hit and then it's like, well, there's nobody coming to the buildings. Do you really need them to get people into your buildings? And then they started pivoting towards communication, what's happening in the space and all that. So, so I think that definitely is when I think what's interesting to me is, is Heinz and, and others start to look at this is the, the use of the office space and the culture change of our employees. Because even for Heinz, we're building a new headquarters. We're based out of Houston. We're building a new headquarters office uh, and we're supposed to move in 2022 to a new headquarters. We've been in the old headquarters for over 30 years. And, and everybody's used to their own office, everybody's used to having their space, and the building we're designing now, it won't accommodate all employees. And so, so we're really focused right now on this new way of working of, 
of when you show up, you may not have a desk. You will have to reserve a desk. You will have to maybe sit out in the open, and so you're used to being in a closed office environment. And so, so I think what's fascinating to me is because our, our, our tenants are saying that we don't need as much space, but that means your employees have to work differently, right? And so we all got used to working from home. You know, some of us had good offices at home, some of us didn't, some of us were in the kitchen with the kids. Well, now, when you think about what's going to happen when you go back to the office, you may have that same experience where you're not going to have a quiet space. You're going to have to have more, you know, huddle rooms, more, more bo phone booths, you know, and so you're having to, you know, bring in things into your office spaces that were kind of cool before pandemic, but now they're going to be requirements. And I think so, I think the bigger focus, maybe the bigger conversation is around our employees and that culture shift that we're all going to have to go through when, when we have to start working a little differently. And then we also launched uh, a kind of a WeWork type flex space, you know, program right before pandemic, and that started to get explode. You know, I think Joanna mentioned a lot of shared space, but but I still worry about the the culture shift, right? And and the idea that 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 folks are going to have to work a little differently in the office, and that's going to make it harder to convince people to come into the office. It's like if if I can work from home in my private office, and and I've got all quiet I need, and you're making me come to the office, and I got to go reserve a space and sit out there in the middle of the of the room, and if I need a quiet room, I got to go somewhere else. Uh, and then so you're like, well, am I being more efficient? You know, you just took efficiency away from me. So it's, it's going to be fascinating as we try to move people back into the office, uh, you know, from that standpoint. And I think that's one area that we probably need to talk a little bit more about is, is how do you entice that? And, and, you know, I always joke it's beer and wine. You know, I mean, that always works, seems to work. But at some point you run out of that. And so, so I think it's going to be a big challenge for us. Quick. Yeah, never run out of that. But it's going to be a big challenge. And I think we're not talking about that enough. Because, again, even from an IT perspective, we, we were remote already before the pandemic, and we could work remote, but I'm in a hard time convincing my team members to come back to the office, because what they're telling me is, I'm gonna come back in and go down that long commute, I'm gonna put some headphones on, and I'm gonna go to work for eight hours, and I could have done that at home. And so, so I think it's gonna be a major problem of trying to entice folks back uh, into the office from a human standard standpoint. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. No, agree 100%, because office is now a choice, right? So you have to have a good value proposition. And I mean, you think about it. So in order to get into the office, you have to wake up, take a shower, get fully dressed, get in your car, commute to work, <laughs> go find a parking spot. You get up there, you go out to lunch, you're sitting around coworkers that may or may not have germs. You get done with the day and you hop back in your car and you get home only to find out that you've missed your workout class. So it's, it's, we have found that the apps that get us most excited are the apps that are dealing with like these logistics, um, you know, apps that are making this simpler. So, you know, we find stuff that, you know, ease of getting to work. So if you've got an app that is picking a parking spot, that's telling you about commute times, um, that's doing, you know, doing COVID testing, um, tracking, uh, you know, tracking the commute times, that's doing uh, workout regiments, you know, those type of act, apps that are dealing with the logistics of making it easier to have your users or tenants um, in the space, uh, we have been most excited about. Yeah, and I would add real quick, if you don't mind, Joanna, it's funny because I've said it sarcastically, but it's, I'm starting to believe a little bit more when we start talking about smart buildings, how cool would it be if the building told you to come into the office or not that day? Right? If the data of the building and what's happening in the space, is the elevator out of service, is, is there you know, construction down the street, is, is, is the, you know, the L in Chicago delayed, and the, the building to actually tell you, hey, today's a day where you might just want to work from home because of all the data that I've collected around your area, and I know what it takes to get to the office. And so I think, as I think about more what you just described, you know, Sandra, it's like that's the app for me, that's the smart building that's going to tell me you know, as an individual, today's a good day or not a good day to come to the office and made my life better and I'm happier now because of that experience. And we're going to have to use that technology on our journey with a very conscious focus on culture. You alluded to that, Jesse, and we don't know what we don't know. This, we're in a whole new territory right now and we don't want to lose what got us here, but what got us here is not going to get us there. So we've got to distill the best parts of our culture, which means talking to our employees, which means listening to our employees, constantly surveying them. I think the larger we get, the harder it is to, to do that at times, and you guys are both massive organizations. At 2,600 employees, we're like a, a fraction of you, and I think it's hard to, to get a pulse on uh, where we're going. I think that um, we've budgeted next year uh, 
for our departments to, to spend time, and our departments are spread out throughout the country in, in some um, sense or fashion, to get together and have some fun. So we're gonna be scaling back on our office space, but putting some more dollars into making sure our teams get together to do planning and inspirational uh, time, and also just time to laugh and have fun. And, and then we'll see where that takes us there. We're gonna need some apps and some technology to manage our office space that we have uh, more efficiently and do the hoteling and all that, but it, the core of it is people and how do we, we keep those good people motivated, incentive, and enjoying the workplace, being that employer of choice. Yeah, I mean, you can also, I mean, we're a lot smaller, we're less than 200 people, but when I think about our job as, as employers, our job as leaders, why we want people in the office is not because we want to over, you know, look over their shoulder. If, the, if we're doing that, we probably have a bad employee. We should be being there in the first place. But um, it's more about what can we do here when it comes to cooperation? How do we make our workforce happier? How do we make our workforce more motivated? How do we make them more efficient, right? And if we're not doing those things, we're failing as managers and we're failing as leaders. And we obviously are looking to our partners and the owners of these buildings who are looking back to us saying, what do you want? We said, we don't know what we want, but you know, Tell us what you have. And you're like, well, just tell us what you want. We'll make that happen for you. We're gonna, we want you to fill the space. And we're going back and forth trying to figure out, and, and this is an experiment we're all going through together, right? Which is, how do we add value at the end of the day? Um, I want to switch to sustainability. And, and you started with that, Sandra. And, and I think you said, that we, you, know, you said something like we, we were conscious about where we want to be in a building. I think, Joanna, you also brought that up around, you know, we want to be healthy. Um, please raise your hand if you know any ESG metrics about your building that you right now work in. There we go. Keep your hand up maybe if you know just the energy rating of the building. Let's make, do something really small. Couple of hands. Okay, so we like to say that ESG matters. And as we can see right now, a huge part of the tenant, just a regular sample of you know, 100 tenants in the building, nobody knows any metrics about their building. Um, if you're an LP in the room, um, do you put a, raise your hand if you have any hard standard that you require your GPs to report on, that, that if they don't meet it, something bad happens? Yeah, no hands. Um, so maybe starting with you, Sandra, um, how do you know that ESG matters besides us? And I, I think, I believe that everybody in this room really cares, right? In the sense that we, we do want to live in a better environment. We want to be in healthy places, right? So I'm not trying to be cynical about that. I'm trying to be cynical about what we want to pay for, right? So, so I don't really think about like, how do we know what matters to our, to our organization and to the, to the tenants? And, how do we decide what programs we adopt or not in relation to that? Yeah, so it definitely matters. Um, it's really been, I would say, on the forefront for the last 15 years, but uh, the last couple of years, it's kind of taken on this ESG, which is a lot bigger and greater platform. So, you know, additional things that that includes is, you know, first, the community. So. Um, ESG, you know, includes the community. It includes, are you doing movie nights at your property? Are you doing um, get-togethers? Is there green space for your people to uh, meet and convene and um, hang out? Uh, it also includes um, lifestyle. So we're looking at elements um, which are applicable to lifestyle. So what does that mean? That's, um, you know, are we giving creative, healthy food delivery? Do we have the right enhanced light? So when you go and sit in your office, do you have the right lighting? Um, are you offering exercise options as part of uh, your office? Um, I've walked through buildings where they tell me that the air that I breathe is making me smarter. So they're coming up with air that is, is better, better to breathe and really wakens up I your brain. I need some of that air. <laughs> where do you get that air? <laughs> That's exactly. Awful. We all need more of that air. I'm like, pump it through. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's also in lifestyle. And then lastly, it's this concept of the greater good. So we're lowering our carbon footprint. You know, how are we doing that? Are we doing, you know, more so solar panels? Are we doing, you know, what kind of recycle plans do we have? So it's taken on this big mammoth um, platform that uh, we as a company are 100% engaged in. Um, and we've hired, you know, we've hired people to solely focus on, on this and how do we get bigger and how do we get better at this. Um, but also we have our clients, so our investors. This is getting very important for our investors, especially our overseas investors. 
Um, we are also starting to see it with our tenants. Um, tenants coming through our buildings are demanding to see, you know, to breathe some of that air that's going to make their workforce smarter. So um, we're definitely uh, getting it, starting to see it from all ends. And then, you know, lastly, I would say cities are starting um, to be more focused on it. In New York, there's Local Law 97, which is, you know, very much focused on buildings lowering their carbon footprint. Um, and they have a time plan to do so. So um, I think it's becoming very relevant for our industry, whereas you know, in the past it was kind of always a concept talked about. Uh, I would say today we're seeing it through investors, tenants, and the cities. Joanna, do you know how much this costs you as an organization to care about ESG? Oh, we've been doing our green program since 2015, and we started it very intentionally in saying all new acquisitions, we were going to spend money on water savings devices, irrigation systems, LED lighting, and then we go back and retrofit our portfolio. So we just celebrated um, 2 billion gallons of water saved last month. That was the uh, milestone that we reached. So that was pretty cool. And then that, that's $16 million of utility savings and over 59,000 metric tons of CO2 emissions that we've saved. Uh, and, and that isn't savings that necessarily comes to us as a landlord. Our residents participate in the water savings in their units, and we get some for common areas and so forth. But it was the right thing to do, which Sandra mentioned, and we felt like that was part of our culture, our Gen Zers and, and um, millennials care about that a lot. So we were reaching out to our residents saying, not only are we saving you money, but these are all the things that we're doing um, in your units to help. And, and that has bled into smart home technology, um, going in and retrofitting um, our A and B assets as, um, as, as we refinance or acquire them with smart home tech for additional savings. So it's been a, a part of our ethos uh, for a while now. No, that's awesome. And, and Jesse, what do you guys measure? So when you think about, hey, we really care about ESG, we want to see that we're improving, you know, there's the old adage goes, we can't improve what we don't measure. What do you measure besides, you know, energy costs that, you know, obviously matter, but looking for a little broader than that? Yeah, so real quick, and I know we're going to be running out of time pretty soon, but Mr. Hines, when he started the firm in 1957, he's an engineer, and so forever we've tried to run our buildings more efficiently and measured energy, and, and I think we really focused on the E for a lot of years, we, you know, we're LEED certified, platinum, all over the place. And so, but I think, I think for me, going back to answer your question, the pan, if there's something positive about this pandemic is, is it got, got us to focus more on the social, because I think, and, and the governance, because I think you and I have talked about this, we do a lot of nonprofit and, and a lot of community service, but, but I think a lot of firms were just checking the box on the social and, and all the other stuff. And the focus was always on energy, because that's what you can measure. And I think, I think what, what I like is that we're focusing more on, those, on the S and the G, because I think those are just as important when you think about the, the human-centric approach, our tenants, it's about the people, it's about what you're doing with the communities. You know, you guys have talked about, you know, even Heinz, what we're trying to do within our communities and green space and biophilia. And, and so I think, I think it's that that's going to be important. How you measure it, it's going to be tricky, right? Because it's, it's like, you know, how do you measure some of your technology when you try to implement it? There is no ROI because it's hard to measure that ROI, but we know it, it's the right thing to do. And so I think, I think we're all going to learn together on, on how to measure the, the non-energy because that's the hard one. And then on the carbon, that's going to be tough. I mean, I, I talked to our engineers and, and, and it's going to be hard. I mean, it's really hard to try to really make a, a measurable difference and measure it and really be able to def define what you're supposed to measure and, and, and keep it going. So, so it's going to be hard. It's going to be a long haul, but I think a lot of us have started already. And, and I think I agree with, with the regulation. I, I will tell you that, and you can probably agree to this, Sandra, it's, it's, the U.S. is behind in a lot of this. You know, in Europe and Asia PAC, they've been doing this for a lot of years. And so we have a lot to learn from them. And so we're going to leverage our, our global footprint to hopefully learn from them. And hopefully that helps. No, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I would say to the people here who are not really engaged within their community, I, I highly recommend you start being engaged with the community. Besides the fact that it's the right thing to do, you're helping the world, the world's a better place, you'll be in a better place that you live in. If you just want to be utilitarian, if you're managing buildings and you're not in touch with your community, you're not being a good manager, right? You don't know what things they need in their buildings, whether they're residential or commercial. You're not enticing them to come in. So the more active you are in your community, besides the fact that you're going to feel really good about the things that you contribute to that community, it's also going to show up on the bottom line in one way or another. So I highly encourage that. Um, I want to wrap up on you know kind of a, a quick question, but we've been talking about all the things that we see in the market, the things that we've been implementing over the years. Um, 
but what we didn't talk about is what's missing. So we'd love just one thing that, you know, that you know, maybe for some of the entrepreneurs in the audience who are kind of thinking about what they're working on and what they're building, what is maybe one thing, and I'll let anyone who feels comfortable start because I'm putting you on the spot, that, you know, hey, I'd really love to see that. You know, that would be really cool if somebody would pitch that to me. So I, I think there's so many different sources to go for various things within a building, you know, from acquisition of a building to operating a building to selling a building to taking it through the whole life cycle. We're going to so many different sources. I would love to see one source that encompasses it all um, that we can really take the data that we get from that and use it to predict it to predict um, for predictability. You know, we believe in 2030 that buildings are going to become more human. Um, they're going to be more intuitive to their users needs. And the, what's allowing us to do that is the data that comes through and being able to predict. We no longer have to guess what a tenant wants or what a tenant needs. We can tell from the data that comes through. So um, I, I would like to see one source for that to make my life easier. Bingo. <laughs> Centralization and integration of data. Those are our two North Stars right now. Jesse? I agree with that. I think what would be interesting, and we saw some, some examples of this, but I, I, I'm really all into the autonomous stuff, right? I mean, you know, build robotics, if you've seen them, they've got some amazing things that they're doing with construction. You know, we saw some companies uh, in, in Asia Pac that are doing things with movable furniture, movable walls. And so as we think about our office space of the future, 20 years from now, 15 years from now, 10 years from now, to be able to reconfigure those office spaces you know, on a 24-hour basis or even you know, on a daily basis or a half a day or a weekly basis, to me, I think that's the interesting part is, is, again, we keep talking about flexibility of office, how many folks are going to be in the office, what are they going to need while they're in the office. Imagine an office that transform. I'm a big sci-fi guy, so imagine a transforming office. And so to me, that's, that, that would be cool in the future to say, the office is going to change for the needs of that day or the needs of the week. It reminds me of uh, the Microsoft Fortress, which has all the experimental moving uh, furniture. I thought that was really cool. Um, I, I obviously agree with the panel here. And if you're looking for any help thinking about how your data might be connected and used across the organization, there's this cool company that might be able to help you there along the way. Um, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Jesse. This is really good. Thank you all for joining us today. Hopefully, you had some fun. Thank you. Thank you.